Louisiana's claim as the sportsman's paradise held true in the second stop of the Walmart FLW Tour. The world's best anglers bravely traversed the maze like a Chapalaya Basin in search of the big bass that would net $100,000 and valuable points for the season ending's Jacobs Cup. Larry Nixon joins today's show to reveal the winning tactics from the winning anglers starting right now on FLW Outdoors. And welcome to another edition of FLW Outdoors. We're joining you from Morgan City, Louisiana. We've got Taylor Carr and Larry Nixon. I'm Carlton Wing, and today we're going to review the championship tactics from the second event of the FLW Tour. If you look at the Atchafalaya Basin, which is where we fish, it's pretty much all of South Louisiana. Larry, how does an angler decide where to fish on the Atchafalaya Basin? There's so much water down here, it confuses even the old pros. I've been here in 1980, and I'll tell you what, I don't know where I was at. You get a good map, maybe a little local information from one of the local guys to point you in the right direction and go out there and scout around and see if you can find some fish. It was the second stop of the FLW Tour and navigation was certainly unique in this event. It wasn't very difficult at Lake Okeechobee. It's just a big circle and you kind of find your way by looking at a clock even. But one of the similarities was is at Lake Okeechobee the winners flipped and here the contenders flipped as well. That's right. They caught a lot of their fish flipping and uh, we had a big cold front come through right before the tournament and it got that water temperature down to about 50, 52 degrees and it makes these fish go under duck mill or close to stumps and things like that and uh, they get difficult to catch so you got to flip a bait right to them. But we got on a warming trend and Paul Elias utilized it. Of course, Larry competed in this event, but now looking back on what you learned on two days of competition, would you do anything differently? Well, I probably, uh, you know, I don't know what I did wrong to not catch the weight the first day that I really felt like I needed to be in contention. The second day, I had three nice fish about 11 o'clock, and I, I knew I needed eight more pounds to make the cut. And I come out on the lake there, and I said, if they're on these cypress trees, I'll make it. And my, I'm flipping, and my partner catches a five-pounder on a spinnerbait just about 10 minutes. And I said, oh, me, if I stay, I catch two, I make the cut. I stayed two and a half hours and didn't get another bite, so that's fishing. <laughs> well, Larry, yeah, that wasn't funny, guys. <laughs> I could have at least caught two more out of my creek, finished my limit, and got a few more points for the championship. But I wanted we to make the cut. We were pulling for you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> we still want you to interview uh, yourself in one of these I shows. Know. I wanted to make the cut bad, but it cost me some points, I'm telling you. Well, we will have our three, three of our finalists will join us a little bit later on in the show with Larry. And, of course, it was a huge day for Paul Elias. Oh. Paul just showed out. His fish really turned on, and uh, he had a spinnerbait and a buzzbait bite going, and it was just, you know, amazing. Larry will also talk to Bill Chapman all the way from Salt Rock, West Virginia. Bill Chapman, he fished in canals and took a big jig, and, you know, he worked that cover to a tee and caught some big fish and finished in second place. It was a great story for Dave Lefevre who in just his second FLW event, all the way to the top three. That's right, he's a young fella, a rookie, his first year to fish the FLW tournaments, and for him to finish third, it's just a, you know, that's just a great feeling for a young boy. Larry and three of our finalists are coming up a little bit later in the program, and coming up next on FLW Outdoors, a review of all the exciting action from the Atchafalaya Basin. Chafalaya Basin is the biggest and most complex fishery on the FLW Tour this year, but anglers knew it held fish everywhere. Matching quality and quantity would be the key to making it past the first two days and into the top ten. Japan's Marizo Shimizu had a good start, a two-pounder on the way to a five-fish limit. He caught it flipping, and that's what James Shockey was doing when he caught his first keeper. So was Dave Lefebvre flipping his way to a five-fish limit on the road to his first FLW final. But JT Kenny had the day's best flipping bike, and along with the spinner bait, he took the day one lead. I caught my first three on a uh, Berkeley jig, and as the sun really started warming the water up, I noticed the water temperature was coming up, the fish started moving high, and I started throwing a spinner bait, really burning it past the stumps. Jambalaya Basin, day two. 
On day two, the bite improved some, with 50 anglers catching limits. Wes Thomas employed local magic to vault from eighth to second with his lucky Mardi Gras beads. The fish have pulled back, and the, most of my fish I'm catching, you know, four or five feet off the grass line. A lot of guys are still fishing right on the grass line. I go right in behind them and catch fish. Rookie Lefebvre told Charlie Evans he was living a dream come true. His second straight catch of 15-12 led all qualifiers and kept the dream alive. The rest of the top 10, Thomas, Bill Chapman, Gary Klein, Andre Moore, JT Kenny, Jack Bell, Paul Elias, Dwayne Horton, and Jimmy Millsaps. Jambalaya Mesa, day three. It's now day three, and each of our 10 finalists are fishing the spots that brought them to the top 10, all except for Paul Elias. The Mississippi Pro saved a shallow water area he found in practice just for this opportunity to go for the championship. Within 20 minutes of arriving, Elias showed his decision was going to reap big dividends. Yes, yes, that's what we came after right there. Yeah. You beautiful thing, you. In just over half an hour, Elias has a limit and can begin culling and singing. Fishy, fishy in the brook. Coming by the pond, Paul's hook. You can look for Elias's hit single, Fishy, Fishy, on the FLW Outdoors soundtrack coming soon to a Walmart near you. It sure is a special feeling to have 17 pounds in your life well before 10 a.m. Nice little fish. Fuji Pro Wes Thomas made his charge later in the day. At 12.30, Thomas was the last of the finalists to land a keeper. Let's just say he really appreciated getting on the scoreboard. Hallelujah! <laughs> Once the skunk was out of the box, Thomas wasted little time in voting three more keepers and celebrating every one of them. Yeah, so baby! Good gosh, you don't know how much better I feel. You can't believe about the time the fish turned on for Thomas, Bill Chapman got on a hot streak. Just before 1 o'clock, the West Virginia native pulled in a 3.5-pounder on a jig, followed by a 4-pounder just 15 minutes later on a spinnerbait. And just like that, Chapman was making a run at the top of the leaderboard. At day's end, Paul Elias held a 1-pound, 9-ounce lead heading into the final day. Chapman was second, followed by Jimmy Millsaps, Dave Lefevre, and J.T. Kenny. Jambalaya Big Sun, day four. When day four arrives, the boats line up in order. There is one leader, nine challengers, and no reason to hold back. I've been taking it real gentle on the fish, as gentle as I could be, and still make sure that I made what I needed to do, you know. So today I'm going to really hammer down on them. I don't know what's left, but I feel like I can catch a good stringer of fish. Dave Lefebvre left launch knowing a big day was needed to have a shot at the title. Yes, all right. That's a good way to start this day, man. Dave's hot start would continue. Striking quickly, he was culling by mid-morning. Only two anglers turned in stringers weighing at least 15 pounds. Lefebvre had one of them. Bill Chapman entered the day just a pound, nine ounces off the lead. His strong start came on back-to-back -back casts. Another good one. How do you follow up the largest stringer of day three, the largest of day four? Paul Elias picked up right where he left off in his specially preserved championship area. Elias had a limit in his live well at 9.39. The rest of the day, he culled and looked ahead, anticipating what promised to be a rewarding day. In the weigh-in's final moments, only one angler stood in the way of Elias's first ever FLW victory. It is time now to bring up your fish. Dave is our challenger, trailing by five pounds and one ounce. Dave Lefebvre for his <laughs> limit fish. The Everstart champion now, FLW Touring Pro, reaches in for his limit fish. Needs to be a good one. It is a dandy. Needs five pounds, one ounce. This one weighs in at three pounds, 13 ounces, not enough. Paul Elias is our champion. Still with fish to weigh. Paul yeah. Elias, let's bring it up, get a total weight. Little icing on the cake for our champion, Paul Elias. His final fish weighs in at five pounds, even a champion, Paul Elias. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. The final leaderboard displayed an impressive array of FLW stars. On top, Paul Elias, winning by over six pounds. 
Bill Chapman barely edged Dave Lefevre by just three ounces. Jimmy Millsaps took fourth place, followed by Andre Moore, who moved up two positions from his Friday total. Gary Klein took sixth, and Wes Thomas moved up to seventh. J.T. Kenny, Jack Bell, and Dwayne Horton finished eighth, ninth, and tenth. Here's a look at the tournament through the numbers of the Stanley stats. One good satellite map and one good GPS were essential to navigating the dizzying cuts and runs of a Chapalaya. Two events. That was all it took Pennsylvania rookie Dave Lefevre to make an FLW final. After finishing 27th at Okeechobee, he's third in the overall season standings. 20 pounds, 4 ounces was the largest stringer of the tournament. Kim Stricker almost came back from 87th place to make the cut, missing the finals by just 9 ounces and finishing in 12th. The Shop Back Clean Sweep Award went to Bill Chapman, whose total weight for the first three days, 46 pounds, 8 ounces, best of the finalists. The Energizer Keeps On Going Award went to Paul Elias, who came back from 20th place on day one to make the cut on day two and win it all on day four. Paul Elias has waited a long time for a championship like this one, and victory was sweet. And Elias and everyone else love this fishery. There's so many places to fish here and so many fish in this area, they want to come back to the Atchafalaya Base. And I predict we'll be coming back real soon. But we'll be coming right back on FLW Outdoors with Larry Nixon and third-place finisher Dave Lefever. FLW Outdoors is brought to you by Walmart. Always low prices, always. By Fujifilm. Do you speak Fujifilm? I got it all figured out. I, I got it narrowed down. I'm fishing, uh, I mean, they're going to try a tube, or 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 maybe a tube even. Welcome back to FLW Outdoors. I'm Larry Nixon, and with me I've got Dave Lefevre from Erie, Pennsylvania. Great tournament, Dave, and uh, just an excellent job. And uh, I know you're probably proud of third place, but you'd sure like to head first, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's a... Uh... A little disappointing, but I'm just happy to make it into the top ten, and I'm really excited about sitting here with you, and uh, <laughs> man, if I'd have known this is what I had to do to sit and talk to you, man, I would have done it a lot earlier. Oh, now come on, you're making, <laughs> you're making me blush. <laughs> well, I think you did a tremendous job, and you dismissed second place by three ounces, and uh, uh, you, just, you, re you really caught your fish out of an area where a lot of other contestants were fishing, and uh, you did a few things, I think, uh, a little bit different that helped you catch enough fish to make that cut. And uh, would you talk to me just a little bit about your lure choice yeah. and your line choice? And... Um, well, I was excited to come here in the first place because it's a big a big area. You know, we fish a lot of places that are a little smaller, and they fish small anyway. Right. This, this place fish big, so I was excited to get here. This is a lure Jensen speed trap in a clear color, and, and the water was super muddy, so it's kind of an odd choice, but I have a lot of confidence back home doing that. And, just covered some water within 10 minutes of the launch here, and I just stumbled onto a pocket that was a little bit too good for me to ignore during the tournament. <laughs> so so I saved you making that big run. Right, I ended up just spending a lot more time fishing, and, and it kind of felt, felt good. I want to go see Charlie. You actually used light line in a, in a smaller tube, maybe in a lighter weight than most of the fishermen did, and I, I, that was probably pretty important in making that top 10. Yeah, yeah, there was a... There was at least eight boats in the area, and it's it's very small, and it, it kind of scared me because I didn't see anybody in there in practice, and uh, I started out thinking I was going to go in there and flip, flip, you know, flip for uh -huh. them, and everybody was flipping, so I, right during the tournament, I actually grabbed a rod out with 12-pound test, something I do back home a lot, fish, fish a lot of crowded water, and uh, ended up going with this, this tube on 12-pound test. It's just a, a small ISG tube. It's a company out of Wisconsin, right. and... Uh, it's just a small lot, green pumpkin. Right, I got a lot of short strikes on it, so I ended up starting to cut that those tentacles down a little bit, and uh, I was getting over 50 bites a day, every day, all, all the way till the last day even, and I know some of them are gar and a shoe pick or whatever you right, call them down pick. here, we call them bow fins, but uh, going down, you know, I was using a 16th ounce penetrator weight, which is what them guys were using up at Okeechobee, same same bait, just a, a lot smaller version right. of it. And the, that slow fall and, and fishing out off the grass just a little bit further. Seemed now, to did, did any of the other guys that was in there with you, did uh, any of them do any, any good no, at all the first a, two days? No, the, the one or two fish, each guy. Um, Steve Daniel, one of the, you know, a very good flipper, he was in there. And he did he did sack them up both days, he, but he didn't quite make the cut, which helped me out a lot. Well, there must have been a lot of fish in there then. He oh, did yeah. good. Yeah, it was, it's a spawning area. Um, there's, there's a couple of ponds in the back, you know, there's two dead-end cuts and they open up in the back and that's where the fish were heading to. 
They mess with your mind. Good fish, good one. Oh, praise you God. Yes, all right. It's a good way to start this day, man. You know, from what I saw right there, I would say that the way you were fishing with light line and a light sinker and a smaller tube, you were finessing fish that wouldn't bite other people's lures. Right, I think so. Mm -hmm. The the current was the was now, the what main... happened in that? What 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 created that little mess up there? I <laughs> see you whale roping one in. <sighs> Boy, that was scary. <sighs> Never done that before. I picked a good day to try it, huh? That, that that one there, my line, I set the hook and my line just wrapped around my rod tip. I've never oh, had that. Oh, a knot around your tip. And I, and I, and that's a big fish there for, for that <laughs> no day. No kidding, that was a good one. And I didn't know what to do. I was going to grab the line and, and I ended up just saying, just making a spur of the moment decision. I dropped the rod and just real oh, well, well, I, I, I tend to get backlashes, you know, when you get a mess and all of a sudden your line starts going out. And I thought, oh man, one's got it in my reel moment. <laughs> I just get the line and go, boop, and then wind them yeah, in my that's, head. Yeah, that's the first time I ever did it and I picked a bad time to start doing no, that. No, we just caught you on camera. Yeah, but uh, it, the, as the water rose, the current came in there and, and it, it, it helped me because it concentrated the fish in a couple of the, 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 the little pockets that went back against the current. Right. And those stayed clear. And as that happened, those fish kind of pulled into those two cuts where I hadn't got bites in practice. And they concentrated in those, those two areas. So the last two days, I was really fishing a small area. Dave, I'm a pretty picky bass fisherman. When, I, when you get in my boat, uh, Denny Brower always tells me that, son, you're way too organized. I mean, I like to find everything I've got in my boat. But after watching some of this footage of you and, and your fishing, I think I found my match as far as somebody <laughs> that has all of his gear in order. Yeah, in, the, in this kind of tournament, I think you have to have everything perfect. I mean, that means a lot. What, what's that hanging on that little deal there? That's like that hand hole. On the, Is that your waist scales? That's my um, balance beam. Your balance beam. Yeah. Now, I don't go that far. See, I have to hunt mine. Now, that's <laughs> very smart. That's good. You yeah. know, for a young guy, you are you look very organized, and uh, you always got everything in the right spot. Your net's always laid out perfect. Now, right. Look, you're setting it up there. You're getting ready. Amazing that you you made this cut this quick in an FLW event. Your rookie season. Yeah, I'm I'm proud. I'm proud of it. I know three you ounces, are. though, it hurts. It really does. <laughs> well, good luck to you over at Murray. That'll be our next stop. All and, right. uh, uh, you're sitting, I think, about third in the standings right now. That's pretty good after two events. You're ahead of me. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations again. Thanks a lot, Larry. Uh -huh. When we come back, we'll be talking to Bill Chapman, our second place finisher. Nobody ever remembers who's second. The heck they don't. You won $35,000. Welcome back. With me, I've got Bill Chapman. He finished second in the tournament on the Chafalaya Basin. And, well, I'll tell you what, Bill, you did a great job out there. Come real close. You came real close. You really did. You know, just one or two big bites and you to pull this one off. That's what I needed, one big bite on the last day, and I just couldn't get it. Now, you was fishing actually in a canal, wasn't you? In a canal, yes. Was it a, was it a dead end, or was it one of them canals that's uh, long? It was dead end. I'm going to fish this pretty quick. If I don't get a bite soon, I'm going to go back to that bank where I caught the fish yesterday. Good fish. Come on, girl, get up here. Come on, girl. Come on. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, Lord. That's a good one. Now, the fish that you caught, were they really positioned on cover? I mean, could you pretty much pick out where you was going to get a bite throughout um, the week? Until day four, yes. They were on stump. Most of my big fish come under mats. There was a uh, floating duckweed. Yeah, yeah. And that yeah. wind would bunch it up on the wood cover. Right. And I was dropping a heavy jig through that mat, and that's when I got my bigger fish. Yes. Nice one. Anytime you got mats and cold water and warm sunshine, them big fish sometimes they like to ease up under. Just like stuff. a magnet, That's it right. pulls them right to it. That's right. Now let me look at the jig you were using there. It's a, a three-quarter ounce. Uh, uh, actually, I'd call it a bullet nose jig, something that'll penetrate that cover real good and it don't hang up real bad. Right. It's with a pretty heavy weed guard in it, crawfish colored, brown, orange, and green pumpkin looks like. Uh, you know, it looks just like a Louisiana crawdad. Yeah, and I added a double <laughs> rattle to it. 
double rattle on the back. Sometimes I would hold that jig in the mat for up to a minute, shaking it, before the fish would come to the noise and actually hit it. Well, I mean, now, of course, this is a big bass lure. There's no doubt about it. It's the way to win a tournament is to fish a big jig when you, when you can get them to bite it. Right. And, you know, probably the only thing that kept you from winning this tournament was it warmed up every single day. And on day four, the cloud cover scattered the fish. That's right. And Paul was fishing what, the, what I would call flat skinny water with scattered cover, right. and your water was more vertical edged, and exactly. when the fish come up off that bottom, it made them harder to catch for you on the last day. Sure did. Bill, there was one fish catch in the, in the, that was shown at the weigh-in that this fish actually got you. I mean, he just tied you up to the point. I was down on the floor digging around, and talk to me a little bit about that. I set the hook on it, and the water was boiling, and it took, pulled my rod down, and it tied up. I, just, I knew the fish was still on it because I could see the water rolling, but I couldn't feel him. He was tied up so bad. So the only thing I did is go get him. Well, what would you have done if you'd have reached down there and you felt a big mud fish down there? So? I, I felt his body before I stuck my thumb uh, in his mouth. I would think so. <laughs> now, they got some shoe pick down here that'll bite your whole thing. They sure off. do. But I, I got my hand down there, felt if it was a bass, got my thumb in his mouth, and got him in. <laughs> you just needed that one big one yesterday. That's just all you need is one I, great big one. I had a big, big, big bite on day three. I had one that was probably about eight pounds. I lost it on day three. Had it to the boat and lost it. And that, I still have nightmares over it. <laughs> I'll bet you do. Big fish. Oh. Man. What a hog. She hit it swimming it, too. That kind of upsets me. Don't mind losing when I don't get to see him, but that one there hurt. Well, you still did a, a great job, and, uh, 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 you know, finishing second is not all bad. He's not always forgotten. I'll take second in every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to you, Bill. Thanks. I think you did a great job. Thanks. FLW Outdoors is brought to you by Banana Boat. Get on the... Welcome back. With me, I've got my good friend and the tournament champion, Paul Elias. Boy, do you feel good? Man, it, it's a ride, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get off either. <laughs> There's something special after you hadn't won one in four or five years, hadn't you? Yeah, it is. You know, you, we were talking about it earlier. You know, you get up there in years a little bit, and these youngsters are kicking you around pretty good, <laughs> and you get to thinking about it, man, I'm going to be able to do this again or not. You know, so it does feel good. One of the hardest things for me after I went on about a five-year drought was it got to getting in my mind, you know, that you're no good no more. <laughs> Did you ever think of that? Oh, yeah. You know, it, I thought about it a lot. But you know, it feels, whenever you know you can get around the fish, you know, I knew mechanics was what has been messing me up tonight, but as long as I can still find them, you know, sooner or later I'm gonna catch them. That's right. Yes! Yes, 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 yes! Thank you, Lord, thank you. <laughs> Valentine! Mwah. Was this area you went into, was it hard to get in? I mean... Well, we're actually where I won the tournament the last two days, it, was, it wasn't hard to get in. It was just, you know, a scary deal because you knew if you... If I was running through a lot of real skinny water. And if, if, if I didn't get there, if I had to sit down before I got there, I was done. I, could, I wasn't going to get back up. Couldn't idle out or nothing. You just have to troll out. Because yeah. you don't jump off in this mud out here because you go up to your waist. Right. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Too many snakes and alligators. <laughs> right. Mentally, it keeps you on edge. Paul, let's take a look here at some of this footage and uh, kind of talk your way through this and tell me what you're doing right in here. Well, I'm, I'm spinnerbaiting, and I'm, you know, and I'm fluttering that spinnerbait. There was a lot of holes in the grass, and most of the grass was up to the surface. And what I'd do is every time I'd hit a hole, and they'd just be little small holes, right. you know, and, and I'd just slow it down and flutter it in the hole real good and, and ease it over. Would you and actually let it sink down out of sight? Yeah, well, not quite out of sight, but you really couldn't because the water's so shallow. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't sink it out of sight. But, but uh, you know, and almost every fish hit the spinnerbait while it was fluttering, fluttering just, just, you know, you let not, it not, on, a, not on a pull. And yeah. that, that was a key deal to, to getting the bite. Well, that fish there, you, you that, missed him on a, on a spinnerbait and went back and got him on a tube. Yeah, I got him on this uh, dragon tube here, a man's dragon tube. And, and I, I caught several that way, throwing back on fish and struck at other baits. That's, a, that's a good technique for going back and catching fish that you miss on right. another lure. Just had a little eighth ounce water gremlin weight on it and pitch it out there and, you know, and they, almost every one of them hit it, you know, after they 
miss my bait. Now, let me see your best two baits. I caught them. My, you know, this, this was definitely my best two baits. They're both man's classic spinner right. baits. This is a titanium classic, and this, and this is a regular 3 8 ounce classic. You know, I caught all my fish the first two days. I was fishing in different water, and I was catching them off of logs in, in, in a different area. And I caught all my fish on this big thumper blade, you know, and then a heavier spinner bait, a half ounce spinner bait, and a totally different color, you know. Well, this was around the wood. This was around the wood. Right. And then the last two days fishing grass, I went to the willow leaf and the smaller, smaller spinner bait because the water was only, you know, two foot deep at the deepest. Any particular reason why you went from the orange to chartreuse and blue and white? Well, actually, I had both of these rigged up that morning when I ran in there and I started throwing this one and I threw it about four or five casts and I didn't get bit and I, I picked up the other one, you know, and I, I started throwing it in my second cast I got bit, so I stayed with it. Good old fisherman <laughs> instinct, that's what that's called. Yeah. Now after that you switched over to the buzz bait. I know you caught some of your best fish yesterday on that bait. I mean, just tremendous strikes. Well, I did, and I, you know, it was frustrating because it just seemed like they were hitting it with their mouth closed. I had a trailer hook on there and everything, and they just, they'd go, boosh, you know, and, you'd, and you'd, you wouldn't even touch them, and you'd say, yeah, it disappeared, he had it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at it coming across these clumps here. I want you to watch this fish attack that bait now. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was that five he pounder. Just he just, he did. He didn't have a problem getting it. He got both hooks. You know, well, that's one of the things. I didn't, that, I didn't realize how big he was. You know, oh, when, is I, when that I right? saw him, I said, whoa, I need my net. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we'll have more with Paul Elias. His final fish weighs in at five pounds, even a champion, Paul Elias. It's been almost five years since I've won a, a major tournament, and uh, I tell you, it starts working on your head a little bit. Welcome back with Paul Elias, the winner of the FLW tournament on the Chafalaya Basin. Paul, uh, yesterday morning, uh, Saturday morning to be exact, uh, you made a comment on stage that uh, you woke up at three o'clock and couldn't go back to sleep. Oh, man, I, you know, I was nervous, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and when I woke up at three o'clock, I woke up wide awake. You know, and I just I laid there for a little bit, and I said, "Shoot, I got to get up." You know, I just got up and went and found a cup of coffee. And, and just, you know, kinda, just waited. Just kind of thought about the day, you know, how, how's it going to go? Am I, you know, am I mechanic's going to blow it or the fish going to do me wrong or what? You know, you get to thinking about all that kind of stuff. But I had a pretty positive, I, I had a pretty positive attitude going in. Right. I know uh, big tournaments do that, you know. We're used to getting up at 4.30 to 5 every morning and uh, you get in that habit and then all of a sudden you're doing good in the tournament and for some reason your body just Boom, you wake up, the first thing you think of, are they going to bite for me? Yeah. And then <laughs> you can't go back to sleep. Oh, I can't. But I, I'm automatic anyway. Once we start fishing on the, the tour, I don't even need an alarm clock. I never get, I never use an alarm clock. I, I wake up automatically at 4 o'clock or whatever. Really? I do. Well, I set one, but I usually wake up before it goes off. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't even set one anymore. Of course, I room with a guy, Tom Mann Jr., and he, he sets one, so if I did oversleep, right. you know, he'd have one. Right. But I never have to use it. I noticed Christy and your kids got to show up yesterday. I know that had to make you feel real good. Christy, if, if Paul wins this event, how would it change his life and your life? Well, this will be the first time that, since Paul and I have been married, that I've been on the tournament trail with him, that he could bring this on home. And so I came to watch him bring it on home. Man, that was great. That was, that was just made it so sweet because my kids have never gotten to be there when I won something, you know. Really? And, and yeah, and, and Christy, she's behind me 100%. And, She's great to me and, you know, puts up with all the mess, you know, oh, being, gone, I know it. being gone all the time, not being there for them when they need you, you know, so she's she's 100% with me. And women got a full-time job taking care of everything when we're on the road. That's I terrible. And she does an excellent job. Well, I'm real proud of you. You did good. And congratulations on winning your first FLW. I'm thank real proud of you, old buddy. You. Appreciate it. FLW Outdoors is brought to you by... Welcome back to FLW Outdoors. We want to thank Larry Nixon and three of our finalists from the Atchafalaya Basin, Dave LaFever, Bill Chapman, and of course our champion, Paul Elias. The angler's decisions, Carlton, of course, one of the big ones, where do they go to fish? Gary Klein, who had one day's practice, made a decision to make a long run, about an hour and a half. Now, would that pay off? On day four, there was some question. And that is one of the big decisions an angler can make. As you say, a short practice period, but that spot had produced so well for him in the first three days. This is Gary making a catch on day four, his second fish of the day, but he didn't have much time left to fish, and he had several other spots in that area that he might fish. Listen carefully as Gary Klein second guesses his decision. That's two. It's 11.30. 
took it about an hour and a half. Execute. It doesn't take long, boy. You can get me in an area that's got them, and I can catch them. Thing is, finding that area, so I've gotten lucky on those two fish, and you know, trying to put them on a target that I can kind of isolate and fish through here a little bit quicker is kind of key. And of course, you know, these fish, that fish there came off of an outside stump. And I can see a few more stumps across this flat right here, so you know that if there's a fish by each one of them stumps, I'm liable to have a limit by the time I finish fishing this flat. I don't know what else to do. I mean, I want to catch them on a jig. They're usually better quality fish. I just, uh, right now I'm kicking myself for not coming in here right off the bat. And that was kind of my game plan. I was going to try to start out and fish fresh water, and I didn't. So I don't do any good. It's my own fault for making a poor decision. And that's kind of half the battle in competitive fishing is decisions and commitments. And uh, hopefully I can make me up a little bit of ground here in the next hour and a half. How important was that decision for Gary? He got to his new spot at 11 a.m. Within an hour, he had three quality keepers. Gave Gary something to think about. And he's fishing well this year. As you'll see later in the show, he is near the top of the Land O'Lakes Anger of the Year standings. Now, the folks of South Louisiana have been great hosts and have a unique way of speaking. The word Atchafalaya, though, is one that tripped up some of the visitors. Let's listen now as we ask folks who are visiting South Louisiana how they pronounce the word Atchafalaya. Chafalaya, Chafalaya. Appalachian, Chafalaya. Chafalaya. Appalachia. Chafalaya Basin. How do you pronounce the area we're in now, this basin? Uh, the Chafalaya Basin. One more time? Chafalaya Basin. That's the correct way of saying it. But I was always told it's the Chafalaya Basin. Appalachia. This basin area starts with an A. How do you pronounce the name of this basin? Chafalaya. Say it one more time? Chafalaya. No way. The locals told me it's Chafalaya, and I was scorned by a local at a restaurant not too long ago when I said Achafalaya. So as far as I know, or the locals say, it's Chafalaya. A Chafalaya Basin. Well, I say Chafalaya Basin, but I don't, some of the local people here puts the A in it. Most of the people just say Chafalaya. How do you pronounce the name of this area where we're fishing? <laughs> uh, Appalachian. Appalachian Basin, I think. I don't know. I call it Appalachian Basin. How's that? Appalachian Basin. Don't ask me. I'm from South Carolina. I'm not from Louisiana. <laughs> Say Lake Murray, can't you? Lake Murray. <laughs> oh, Appa. Go ahead. I call it Big Water. Appalachian. That's the way Ricky pronounces it. <laughs> the area seems to have as many pronunciations as it has cuts and canals. So we sought some local expertise. My name's David Goulas from Morgan City, Louisiana, and we're fishing in the Chafalaya Basin. Been here all my life, and the way you say it is the way it's spelled. How's that? Chafalaya. All right, so say it with me now. A Chafalaya. Very good. Thanks to all the great folks of the Chafalaya Basin, the anglers want to come back here real soon. Well, and the anglers picked up some valuable points in our season standings for that Jacobs Cup. Half a million dollars to the winner, $1.5 million for the total purse. We're going to give you a preview of the Jacobs Cup by reviewing the last FLW Tour Championship. We've got some great video of John Sappington and Gerald Swindle coming up next on FLW Outdoors. Yeah. Welcome back to FLW Outdoors and Morgan City, Louisiana, the Atchafalaya Basin. Stop number two on the FLW Tour in Carlton, the road to Richmond. And of course, this year's Jacobs Cup will feature once again head-to-head -head matchups. To help you get ready for what's in store, we're going to take a look back at the last year's Tour Championship and the greatest head-to-head -head matchup of them all, John Sappington and Gerald Swindle. Good luck, John. It's just moments from the launch, and both championship finalists are fishing two completely different patterns. John Sappington is fishing a crankbait, going for a reaction bite in the trees on the west side of the lake. A big grass bed area this way that's got channels and ditches in it, and you got a big grass bed back this way that's got channels and ditches in it. That water's come down, if you look at the trees, when that water falls, the fish will move out to the points, and this is just a big point right in between them. A self-professed dock junkie, Gerald Swindle is using a spinnerbait and fishing shallow. 
I know I'm fishing them shallow and everybody else. Go spinner bait early, get on up in the day, pick up a big splipping stick, start flipping the isolated cover. The whole key is finding brush piles under these little isolated rock pile or brush pile, a ladder, two poles, anything that's different than the rest of the dock. You see that ladder under that pier there? That's the kind of stuff you're looking for, where it's more than just one board, one pole. You can throw a spinnerbait around them in the morning, sometimes you catch a big one. It wasn't a big one, but Swindle got on the board first at 7.06. That's one. The party has now started. Spinnerbait, War Eagle, a little three-eighths. White and chartreuse, double Colorado. Just two minutes later, on the other side of the lake, Sappington got started with what would prove to be the most profitable hour of his fishing career. There's one. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for small favors. Look at him. He's hooked on the front hook. That means he wanted it. There's one. That's a good one, too. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my Thank you, Lord. Good gosh, look at that. <laughs> oh my gosh, broke my hook off. That's the biggest fish I've seen yet. My, uh, I had my dad go buy me that net last night if he hadn't got me that net. <laughs> Sappington now has five pounds in the boat, including that last over the slot confidence builder. Meanwhile, Gerald Swindle is fishing some trees in between docks, not expecting much when opportunity strikes. And this one here, the first day, a few fish living on these trees, but not many. I don't believe you got to worry about catching no giant. Watch me catch a six pounder, look like a fool. I love being a fool. There he is. Come on, B-17. My God, B-17. He ain't. I can tell you. He is. He is. Sackleton, you gotta catch one more. That's it, baby. Huh? Yes! Come! I just got out of my mouth. You don't have to worry about me catching no bigger. Oh, God, it's bigger. What an idiot. I'm an idiot and I love myself. Once again, just minutes after Swindle catches a keeper, Sappington does the same. At 7.41, Sappington added another over the 17-inch slot. Then 14 minutes later, a keeper under the slot gave him four for the day at 7.55 a.m. and just under 10 pounds. Little did the Oklahoma native know he'd caught his last fish of the day. It's now 8.12 and Gerald Swindle is back in the docks and would soon be back at his live well. It was just big enough to be number three. Five minutes later came number four. There he is. A big one, son. Yes! Yes, baby! Yes! Ah. Got a job to do now, son. Got a job to do. Number five wasn't far away. That may just be number five. All right, let's check the room. Check the room, see what we got. I see him, number five. That's five, that's five. All right, now, now, let's crank this party up one notch. The time is 8.35, just two hours after the launch and four and a half hours until check-in, and both finalists have caught their last keepers. The pressure would rise the rest of the morning. I need a $260,000 bite. It would be a tense tent for the afternoon weigh-in where Sappington would prevail by a mere five ounces over Gerald Swindle. FLW Outdoors is brought to you by U.S.